Good evening. My name is Fabio Gigi. I'm the chair of the Japan Research Center here at SOAS, and it is great to see so many of you here in the Brunei Gallery Lecture Theater tonight. Co-hosting the event with me is Dr. Sato Nasuzuki, lecturer in Japanese and modern Japanese history here at SOAS. Good evening. Um, it is a pleasure to be here and to see so many of you. And we would like to um, welcome our special guest, uh, Ms. Uh, Hiroko Morohashi and Mr. Eiji Morohashi. <coughs> we are here tonight to... Oh. <laughs> it stops here. Do you have the rest of the dialogue? <laughs> no, I, I, I thought you had it. I must have left it um, in the office. Well, never mind. Well, being creative, that would be one solution. But we also have chat GPT. So chat GPT, can you write an opening monologue for an event on creativity and AI, or a dialogue rather, for a female and a male presenter, please? Oh, oh. OK. It's a bit spooky here, isn't it? It's a bit spooky, yes. Shall we do that? Then? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So, good, e good evening, everyone, and welcome to our event on AI and creativity. I'm thrilled to see so many of you joining us tonight. Yes, absolutely. It's fantastic to have such a diverse group of individuals here to explore the intersection of artificial intelligence and creativity. So, my name is Sarah. I didn't know that. Okay. We must decolonize ChatGPT, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be one of your, um, uh, your presenters for this evening. I have a background in computer science. I didn't know that. <laughs> me, me either. And a passion for the arts. That's true. Right. So this topic is particularly exciting for me. And I am David, apparently. Hi, David. <laughs> <laughs> I come from a design and engineering background. And I've been fascinated by the ways in which AI is revolutionizing creative industries. So together, we'll be guiding you through a journey into the world of AI-driven creativity, if that's possible. Discussing its potential, its challenges, and its impact on various fields from music and art to literature and beyond. Hmm. We'll be exploring questions like, how can AI enhance human creativity? What are the ethical considerations when using AI in creative processes? And perhaps most importantly, what does the future of creativity look like in a world increasingly shaped by artificial intelligence? So get ready to dive deep into this fascinating topic with us tonight. We have a lineup of speakers and presentations that promise, uh, promise to be both enlightening and thought provoking. Hmm. Not bad, but it lacks a little something, a little esprit, a little wit, perhaps. Yeah, let's see whether we can do a little bit better than this, right? So, ChatGPT, can you write a witty opening dialogue for male and female presenter, or female and male presenter? Let's see. Um, there we go. Yeah. No, that's the old one. <laughs> Uh, chat GPT is playing out. It doesn't like what we're trying to yeah, do here. Yeah, exactly. Let's see whether this works. Okay, so oh, yeah. witty. Yeah, let's, let's do this. Let's see what the wit... Oh, ah, here it comes, here it comes. Slowly. <laughs> Happening. Shall we go yeah, on? Let's okay, go. let's have a try on this. Hey, have you heard about this new <laughs> AI technology? Yeah, I have. It's like having a super smart friend in your pocket, right? Exactly. But you know, sometimes I wonder if it's secretly plotting to take over the world. Oh, come on. Don't be paranoid. It's more likely just trying to find the best pizza place nearby. Ha. Huh. Good point. But imagine if it could actually order the pizza for us too. Now that's a future I can get behind. AI, please bring us the cheesiest pizza in time. Well, not quite. A bit heavy on the pizza versus world domination irony. But as these two examples show, 
Generative AI can be quite useful in an emergency, but can it create something really new? So tonight, therefore, we will explore the connection between art, business and creativity. Where, where does the inspiration come from? Um, how does creativity manifest itself? To create is to bring something into existence that wasn't there before, whether in business, art, even in academia. Our first speaker tonight straddles these divides with a plan. He's a professor at the School of Economics and Management at the University of Hyogo in Japan. He's an accomplished business guru, and he's also an amateur artist. He is the reason why we are here tonight. Please welcome to the stage Masanao Kawakami, Special Visiting Professor at the Japan Research Center here at SOAS. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Uh, I'm very pleased to meet you, and uh, I'm very, very pleased to come back here uh, at SOAS. Yeah. I am Masanam Kawakami, a professor of the University uh, of Hyogo. And uh, I specialize in business model. Business model is so called uh, framework for making money. Yeah. Since last year, yeah, I am also a special visiting professor at SOAS. So, uh, from here, I would like to talk about the importance of creativity and art, especially in the business area. It is said in USA that the MFA is the new MBA. Since this web article appeared in the Harvard Business Review, in 20, uh, 2008, art has been considered important for business. Yes, MFA is uh, yeah master of fine art, you know. And this trend has uh, intensified in recent years. Why? Yes, it's the advent of chat GPT and its huge popularity. In an age when it's easy to get answers uh, if you ask, uh, what do you think is most valuable? The solution itself is no longer worthwhile because we can easily access the answer. What matter is awareness of the issues. How can we brush up our awareness of issues? How? <laughs> yes, I believe that the artist mind or artistship is at the heart of this. This could be described as uh, modern entrepreneurship. If you incorporate, uh, if you incorporate artistship into your own business, your business will become more creative. So, And the key takeaway from today's talks is uh, knowing what we artist mind is like. And understanding that uh, is very similar to entrepreneurship. In your speeches by uh, special people, including my dear friend Hiroko Morohashi from Morohashi Museum of Art, Modern Art in Japan, and after all, world renowned uh, and renowned uh, artist PJ Cook. Thank you all. Thank you. So um, our next speaker has grown up with art aura around her, especially the surrealist paintings by Dali uh, that her father collected. So she has since collected more titles than we can imagine. And she told us earlier that she has roughly 23 different business cards. Uh, she is a member of the board of the United Sports Foundation. She has put a chairperson of the advisory board of Zebio Holdings and also counselor at the Morohashi Museum of Modern Art. Please welcome to the stage Mrs. Hiroko Morohashi.
do you do this? Give me a cheer. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Hiroko Morohashi. Don't worry, we have a great interpreter, though. Hello、えっと、えっと、えっと、えっと、えっと、えっと、えっと、えっと、えっと、えっと、えっと、えっと、えっと、えっと、えっと、えっと、えっと、えっと、えっと、えっと、えっと、えっと、えっと、えっと、
unfortunately, and he passed away in 2003 at the age of 68 due to an accident. But he was somebody who favoured change. And ever since I was small, I was always told that the world changes constantly. Nothing stays the same. You have to be evolved, evolving at the same time. Um, otherwise, growth will never come. え、現在、Today, um, Zevio Holdings has grown on to become a holdings company which operates more than um, approximately 900 stores in Japan as well as other age, Asia um, regions, um, as 50 stores in Asia, and which sells the sports goods. But uh, the company doesn't, is not limited to the retail, uh, retail business. Um, it is involved in various aspects of sports, mar sports markets, for example, in media, uh, league operations, arena operations, and sports marketing is a big part of the business as well. Murahashi Kindai Business Club was a series of business data that was created in 10 years. It was created by the business and the business of the business. It was created by the business of the business. It was created by the business of the business. It was created by the え、に、え、故郷である福島県の万代朝日国立公園の中に設立されました。Morohashi Museum of Modern Art was set up uh, with my father's intention um, that he wanted um, more people to view the masterpieces of western modern art and really be moved by these collections uh, which he has collected over 10 years and the museum was set up in 1992 in Bandai Asahi National Park in Fukushima Prefecture. え、父は青年期より father was very much interested in surrealism um, ever since he was young, um, especially in Salvador Dali's work. Um, and he was um, he felt the great pull um, towards his um, work that was born in, out of Spain. それらは and these collections uh, were first built on his uh, first collections, um, which has really formed the bedrock of the museum. Um, I will, I will explain a little bit of an example. So, and we, it started from 300, around 330 prints and paintings by Dali, as well as, um, which spans, um, and other impressionist and surrealist um, paintings, um, which are around 40 um, works of them, as well as we have a, great uh, pieces from Pamela uh, Jane Crick um, who is present here with us today. え、美術館、美術館は父が中世の馬小屋をイメージし建てられました。生まれ故郷である福島に成功させてもらったビジネスを大好きなアートを通じて福島にそして世の中に還元したいという熱い思いから美術館の窓から壮大な万代さんを美
、えー、彼自身は画家になろうとは思ってなかったようですが、時間があれば世界中の美術館を訪れていました。そしてそれらの作品は印象派等のリアリズムではなく、夢と幻想を絵画にした、従来の常識を打ち破った、以来、ダリ・シュビレスミに興味を抱き、版画、画集等の収集が始まりました。My father, when he was my,、um, in 1975, when my father was 41,、um, he came across、um, Salvador Dali's work in Dali、um, Museum in Figueres, in Spain. And the works that he has seen were nothing、um, that, unlike anything he was familiar with, for example, realism that was depicted by the Impressionists. A lot of Dali's work were based, based on dreams and illusion, and they seemed to be breaking a lot of the common sense、uh, that was captured in the, the previous artworks. And he was Greatly interested in Dali's realism from that point onwards, and he started collecting his prints and paintings. 1991年、えー、ダリ展が東京で開催された際に、その中にパリ・ストラットン財団所有の彫刻37点が出品され、父にとっては油絵、版画よりも、えー、迫力を受け、感銘を受けたそうです。展示会終了後、ある事情から一括してそれらの37点の彫刻を譲り受けることができ、その偶然の出会いにより、父の中でダリ美術館の建設の夢が湧き上がりました。In 1991, Dali exhibition was held in Tokyo.、Um, as part of that, there were 37 sculptures、um, which were、um, submitted by Paris, Paris Strutton's foundations. And When he saw them, he was moved even further,、um, even more than when he saw the paintings and prints. After the exhibitions,、um, he had the, an opportunity.、Um, there was a very opp- opportune event that he managed to get those collections,、um, acquire that, those collections, and that led on, led on for him to have the, this dream of setting up the Dali Museum. そこから10年間、世界中のオークションに参加し、作品を収集、欧米の美術館をして、視察をし、美術館の土地探し、建設の構想と何か取りつかれたかのように、情熱を注ぎ込みました。ロンドン、ニューヨークでのオークションは、私も父に同行し、彼が愛する数々の作品を一緒に落札する体験もしました。The decade following on, um, he has... Went on to many auctions across the world to collect Dali's work and saw many more museums in the West, as well as find, try and find the land for the museums, as well as designing the building itself.、Um, that, led on, that led for him、uh, it to become his passion work. And I have accompanied him at the auctions in London and New York. そして人に喜ばれたいではなく人を驚かせたいという思いが非常に強かった人でした。Both in business and this museum building, my father really exercised different ways to achieve his dreams and goals. It wasn't set in one path, and he had a very diverse mindset. He had great creative mindset to create from nothing、um, to the first point, first step. And that wasn't, that wasn't so much about him to get the Praise.、Um, it was more about he wanted to give the pleasure to people and also to surprise people, to provide that kind of、um, interest, spark the interest. 
。私自身はアメリカ大学卒業後、日本の商社で働き、その後、ゼビオ株式会社に入社、約20年間ほどビジネスの現場で仕事をしてきました。2011年に東日本大震災をきっかけに、えー、ビジネスの方は引退し、えー、そのスポーツを通じて未来を担う子どもたちを育成する財団で今は社会貢献活動をメインに行っております。As for myself, I graduated from a university in America and following on,、um, I have gained a position at a trading、um, company in Japan and, and then I have changed,、um, I have joined the Zebio Holdings. And I was、um, involved in business,、um, its business for 20 years. From 2011, Japan,、um, the Great Japan earthquake、um, has led me、uh, to change、uh, my work into being more involved in the CSR work、um, through the foundations that we have set up、uh, to really develop um, children um, who, will, who are the future、um, through sports. 今私は営利、非営利、両方の立場に身を置いて働いていますが、根本は全く同じことだと考えています。私たちはどのような世の中を作るのか、どういうふうにしていきたいのか、いわゆるインパクトを生み出すために必要な力をアート思考で考える、これが私たちに必要なことだと感じています。We constantly need to question what kind of world we want to create and how we can contribute and make impact in the world. And I believe、um, to come out,、uh, come with great ideas for those and、um, to come out with the solutions, I think art mindset is extremely important. 現在の日本の経営人材育成の全般的な環境は決して充実しているとは言い難い状況にあると思っています。I don't believe that the、um, current situation of Japanese management and resources development、um, is really sufficient enough. The human resources that is required in Japan all across fields is that somebody who has come up with the idea of value creation, somebody who could move、um, people's mindset and hearts, and somebody who could really think about how the business and themselves could adopt into this ever changing world. ました。父が常にゼロイチの人間で、常に何かを生み続け、そして人々を驚かせて感動させていたからです。I believe that、um, this mindset was cultivated、um, and I definitely learned it from my father. He was somebody who constantly thought about how we could create、um, from nothing,、um, bring zero to one, and to really explore the ways to surprise people. 人々が本当の意味で豊かな世の中を生きられるようにするため、現在の過度なデータ情報、そして形式的な合意形成が蔓延した世の中に、新たな発想を吹き込むアート思考、これが世の中に大きく貢献できると信じています。In order for everyone to really thrive and this society to become even richer and for everyone to truly thrive and enjoy living in this world, I I think it is extremely important to bring out new mindset through art, mindset, art formations、um, in this world, which is the overload of data and information and the preconce preconceived idea of agreement. In this case, the SUAS and the Morohashi Kindai Business Council have a partnership with the SUAS and the Business Council. The SUAS and the Business Council have a partnership with the SUAS and the Business Council. アートに興味がなかった人々が美術館に足を運んでくれること、そして
アートが持つ力を多様な思考を持つ人に提供できる場として発展できる可能性があると信じています。この取り組みが美術館が発展する一助になることに感謝し、改めてスワースの皆様、それから川上先生、そしてパブラジェン・クルーク、今日お集まりの皆様に心から感謝を申し上げます。Thank you very much. Hoping that this partnership would,、um, become, um, would become the success of both、um, SOAS as well as the museum, I would like to thank、um, all the staff at、um, University of London and SOAS,、um, Professor Kawakami and、um, Pamela Jane Clark,、um, and all the, to all those、um, who are present in this room today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Hirogoro Hashi. Fabio, I have a confession to make. Really? What is it? You know my love for arts? Yes. Did you know that I love Zebio too? Zebio Sports Shop, actually. <laughs> 80% of my gym gear is from Zebio. Whenever I go back to Japan, I get tons. I hear they have a very big store in Hamamatsu. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And other 20% Sports Direct. <laughs> But anyway, so、uh, next,、uh, let us sort of invite you to the world of Japanese music, shamisen and、um, Japanese folk music. So, Miss, Mr. Josh, Josh Green is a、uh, protege of Mr. Hibiki Ichikawa, who is the、uh, uh, shamisen master here,、uh, based in London. And Ms. Ms. Akari Mochizuki, she's the only professional anchor singer in the UK. So,、um, anchor is the Japanese blues, but I think、uh, they're gonna do Japanese folk music, Mio. So,、uh, let us. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this Brunei Gallery for a fantastic event tonight.、Uh, my name is Akari Mochizuki.、Uh, my nickname is Mochi.、Uh, mochi in Japanese means rice cake. <laughs> so please remember me as Mochi. And this is Josh,、uh, who is the Tsugaru Shamisen player for tonight.、Uh, we are going to give you the great example of Japanese folk music, Minyo music,、uh, to give you a very good、uh, you know, like、energy <laughs> for tonight.、Uh, the first song we are going to play together is actually the medley.、Uh, the first、uh, part is called Tsugaru Jon Karabushi, which is the most well known Japanese folk song from Japan.、Uh, then I will join、uh, Josh after that. Uh, for the song called Tawara Tsumiuta, which means、uh, piling up the rice bale song from Aomori、uh, to、um, count the number of rice bales、uh, in the household,、uh, house、uh, in the old time in Japan, the、um, sign of wealth was measured by the number of rice bales. So it's like a counting song.、Uh, it might sound it's not going to end. But it will end. <laughs> so please enjoy. Firstly, Tsugaru, Jon Karabushi, then Tawara Tsumiuta.
By Josh and I joined in a song called Tawara Tsumiuta. Very energetic song, which sounded almost like a traditional Japanese rap. <laughs> uh, it was very nice uh, for you to uh, clap hands. But now I would like you to enjoy something a bit familiar with you because uh, Josh is going to play the song called Electric, which is the original song composed by Hibiki Ichikawa, his teacher. Uh, he was influenced by UK rock music. <laughs> so you will hear the sound of Japan but sounds like UK rock. Hope you enjoy. The song is called Electric.
Thank you very much. That was the song called Electric, uh, composed by Hibiki Ichikawa, uh, Joshua's teacher. Okay, now I would like to finish uh, by joining uh, uh, Josh uh, uh, singing the song called Donpanbushi, which requires everybody's help to create this song together. Uh, is anyone familiar with Japanese language? I'm sure <laughs> most of you, are, um, you know, like uh, uh, know about Japanese language. But this time, I would like you to sing the chorus together. So it's a very, very big opportunity for you to show your ability. <laughs> uh, okay, I will t uh, tell you exactly what it go how it goes. Can you say dom? Yes. Can you say pam? Wow. Can you say dom dom pam pam dom pam pam? Can you go? Do do pa pa do do pa pa dom pam pam. Perfect. You're now fluent in Japanese. <laughs> Great. So that is the chorus. Okay. So the tune goes. Can you play the chorus bit? Dom dom pam pam dom pam pam dom dom pam pam dom pam pam do do pa pa do do pa pa dom pam pam. Okay, that is the chorus. <laughs> okay, that's so simple. And this, the song uh, has this chorus four times because I sing four verses, but the timing to join is quite clear because I will say very energetically, sort it like this, so you will not miss it. <laughs> I hope you can join. Uh, if you're not confident, just let others sing the first verse, okay? <laughs> and then join from the second verse. Uh, this will be the final song from us. Uh, the song is called Don Pam Bushit. Please put your hands together. Ay, ay, Mochitsuki and Josh Green. You will have another opportunity uh, to hear them play at the reception later on tonight. Now, you have already seen a glimpse of one of the works of our next speaker on our homepage. The time has written that her paintings have the unexpectedness of real life and the hallucinatory clarity of a dream. The Parisian journal Le Figaro has called her 
a virtuoso in the mischievous art of beguiling our perceptions and expectations. P.J. Crook is an English sculptor and a painter and has held exhibitions all over the world. She received an MBE for services to art from the late Queen and will talk to us today about where do we draw inspiration and creativity from. Please give a big round of applause for P.J. Crook. Well, how do I follow that? It was fantastic. I thought I was back in Kyoto for a moment. It was brilliant. Well, being an artist is the only thing I know how to be. It's as important to me as the air I breathe or the food I eat. For me, AI doesn't even come into my vocabulary, really, which probably sounds very naive. But for an artist, the whole creative process is quite magical. Often you don't know where the answers come from. And sometimes I agonize over what to do in a painting if I have a problem. And yet from somewhere, somehow, an answer comes. And I don't know why that is but it's one of those magical processes that an artist is privileged to enjoy. I'm going to show you a few of my works um, as time permits. I was born and grew up in Cheltenham, which is where I still live and where I brought my own family of two children up. So this painting is called Portrait of the Artist, Watching Her Two Children Grow. And you can see I'm looking through the doorway and looking back through time at my children at different stages in their lives. So in the foreground, you can see my son, Nathan, who is an infant building with building bricks and my daughter, Henrietta, in a tutu when she took dancing lessons and in her first school uniform. And Nathan, playing the violin, as he learned to do, but wearing a sailor's outfit. Now, Nathan never had a sailor's outfit, but my father did and told me stories of his sailor's outfit, so it seemed apt to put Nathan into that. So with a painting, you can change time or circumstance. In the mirror, it's hard to see, but there's actually a picture of me playing the piano, and that's wishful thinking because, unfortunately... I don't play the piano, but, and it's also got my parents singing. So I can include anyone at any time in my works. And the wonderful thing is that I'm in control. So this painting um, is in the permanent collection of the Wilson Cheltenham Art Gallery and Museum. And you can see here it's on permanent exhibition and it's amidst a group of paintings and that group, it's called Well-Known People of Cheltenham. And um, at the top right, there's an Angelica Kaufman of one of the founders of the museum. And below that, um, Dorothea Beale, who founded the Ladies' College. And there's a jockey from the race course and lots of other people who are associated with Chel Cheltenham. So I'm quite honoured to be there with my children and, and my the only parents. One who's still alive. Actually, I'm the only one who's still alive, which is a bit worrying. But um, again, yes. um, so, oh. so, so, so it's a bit odd. Right. That, that this isn't stage. That this isn't what was so supposed to happen. This, so these again are paintings painted out of anxiety. My two children were away on holiday independently. Henrietta had gone to Florence and Rome with my sister and Nathan was on a French exchange. And I was so worried about them that I found that um, I needed to send a guardian angel in through the window just to protect them, although they were quite a lot older than this at the time. It's again playing with time. And in the other painting, the second, I'm actually, which I called the terrible twins, I'm actually holding reins on each so that they can't go too far or get into danger. So again, um, 
You can make things happen when you're creative that perhaps don't happen for other people. And these two paintings formed part of um, a collection that were going to New York for my first New York show there. And when my dealer, Lee, saw them, she said, oh, PJ, I just found these too disturbing. Would you mind if we didn't have them in the exhibition? And so I replied, well, they're just as much part of me as any of my other work. If you don't have them in the show, you don't have any of the other works. And probably rather naively, I put the phone down in a huff. Luckily, she phoned back shortly afterwards and said, I can see your point of view. We will include them. So the show went ahead. Um, for my third exhibition with Gallery Alain Blondel in Paris, I decided to use a theme of newspapers. I like painting um, canvases full of newspapers, which I see a bit like history paintings because they're looking at the news on one particular day across the world. And this painting um, was luckily bought by a nice German couple. But things did not bode well for a good exhibition in Paris because Paris had gone into recession. Um, there were bomb scares, metro strikes, and the Parisians were out demonstrating as they do so well. So I didn't have a lot of hope that it would be a great success. This was another work in the <coughs> exhibition which I called Deadline. Um, and another aspect of my creativity is that people, pub like publishers, often use my paintings as images within books or on book covers. And this painting, Deadline, has been used in several art books and on other books um, on media, etc. This is a little book, a French book by a company called Leon, who published the most delightful art books, but they teach other subjects, and this one was on writing. But you can see they've used deadline again, but it looks a little paler here. So in the exhibition, I had a variety of paintings, and I had to think on my feet of different ways of using newspapers because the gallery had asked for a subject and I hadn't had one. So I thought, mm, newspapers. So on the first one, the red door, my mum used to put newspapers on the floor for us to come in um, and with our muddy boots when we were children, my sister and I. So I thought I'll put news a newspaper on the floor to absorb the rainwater. And in the second one, I've you I exhibition before, I'd done a lot of drawings out of my hotel window, and so I decided to make one of those into a painting, and in it I would put a paper aeroplane, because as a child, my father would make paper aeroplanes for my sister and I. <coughs> so that has the paper aeroplane. And in the third one, the green door, there's a newspaper through the letterbox, and over here, we have a tradition, I don't know whether it's as strong now, of schoolboys delivering papers, doing their paper round in the morning and putting the newspapers through people's letterbox. There's also, you can see, a shadow. And I like to have an element of mystery in the paintings. So with that shadow, I mean, it could be you, it could be me, or it could be someone quite ominous or someone quite good. But I like the viewer to come to it with their own interpretation. Reading in bed <laughs> was inspired by my parents who used to read in bed on a Sunday morning and whilst they were having their breakfast in bed. So it's, it's a sort of combination. It's by, inspired by my parents, but it probably looks slightly more like Richard, my husband's parents. Um, and as you can see, the clutter of papers, but the nice cup of tea to go with it. Again, because it was the subject of newspapers, I got a painted fleet on a painted sea. And the boats, again, inspired by the boats my father would make out of newspaper. You know, a, 
a thing that is so disposable that most people see as rubbish, that he could create these wonderful constructions for us. And in the top one, in the corner, there's a child in a paper hat because he also made us newspaper hats. And that's on an undulating surface, and so is the painting below. So they almost look corrugated, though they're made out of wood and covered in canvas. But having corrugated surface stretches me to paint in a slightly different way. And when you walk past one of the corrugated paintings, you get the illusion of movement because the ripples distort the subject matter of the painting. So the second one um, and <clears throat> is actually based on the personal column that used to be in newspapers. I think it still is, but it was how people looked for a soulmate. You know, now it's internet dating, but at one time you looked in the newspaper to try and find someone who you might be compatible with. So here you have the couple embracing um, in the corner, so it's obviously been successful. Um, I don't usually paint still lifes, but I'd asked Richard to get me some pots from the local garden centre. And when he brought them home, he just laid them on the rug. And I noticed the newspapers were Chinese newspapers. So this sparked my imagination. And they also looked so decorative on the rug that for once I made a still life painting. But I put in it little figurines that I'd been given by my father-in-law, a little Japanese figure, um, statuette at the back, some chopsticks, a little pagoda, and um, a little Japanese doll in the foreground, and a fan protruding as well. So it became quite Japanese, although they were Chinese newspapers. I often look at the world outside, and one of the things we all notice are rough sleepers, the poor people that in our cities and other places have to sleep out in the elements. And I know that sometimes they cover themselves when they're asleep on a park bench or in a doorway with old newspapers for the warmth. And so this painting I called The Dreamer, but you can see the newspapers are well wrapped round this figure. The British love fish and chips. <laughs> and at one time, we were allowed to have them wrapped on the outer side with newspapers. And the newspapers were to keep the fish and chips warm. Um, health and safety would not allow that now, but it did then. And Big City, the other one, um, a man's coming up from the subway. I love the idea of people coming out of somehow coming out of the ground. And there's a man reading a newspaper in the foreground, but also at the back of the railings, there's a little newspaper kiosk with a very similar man also reading a newspaper. Um, I don't know whether they're really the same man or two different men, but I like to think of the two figures who are looking over the balcony or the railing as perhaps being detectives looking for a villain. <clears throat> the rugby painting, a scrum, was actually based on the Gloucester rugby team, which is quite close to where I live, Cheltenham, about eight miles away. And I was taken there by um, a filmmaker who made films for HTV because he was doing, wanted to make a little film for my next London exhibition. But he really specialised in sports, so... I made a rugby painting, um, and so he took me there, and by um, floodlight, I actually drew very quickly in my sketchbook and then made this painting. This wasn't actually in the exhibition. Alain had a bookshop as well, and he had this, because it didn't have a newspaper in, had this actually in his bookshop. And this, the second painting is a polo match, homage à Paul. And here, he took me to a swimming pool, but there wasn't a polo match going on. So he, this is where AI would help. He actually had 
pieces of film showing a polo match and then shots of me drawing and he would be going like this in the water so we had the sound effects as well. So um, this painting did actually sell from the exhibition. So um, that was two works that had sold. In the window of the gallery was a painting called Cinema, very based on my sort of early memories of cinema. Um, Alain Blondel um, was rather, thought it perhaps not quite sophisticated enough for a French cinema because there were people um, drinking Coke. But I like to think that the man in the front row, this is how it relates to the newspaper, is writing a review for his paper of the film that they are watching. Well, when this was in the window, Richard happened to visit the gallery because they had run out of books on my work, so he was delivering some more. And whilst he was there, he spotted two Japanese men at a distance who stopped and looked at the window and pointed as if there was some sort of recognition. Anyway, they made their way to the gallery window and as Richard left the gallery, he saw them enter into it and walk around. But he didn't know what had happened. Anyway, about two, he was going to meet our son Nathan, but about two hours later, he returned. And much to his surprise, he walked all around the exhibition and he couldn't believe his eyes because next to each painting was a red spot and a red spot signifies that that painting has sold. And it wasn't just one or two or three. It was the whole exhibition. And the news of this actually went round all the galleries in Paris and all the galleries in London. But people said to me, ah, oh, yes, you know, it's really good to sell your whole exhibition. But if they've gone to Japan, you'll, you'll never see those works again. But lo and behold, in the year 2000, a letter came trundling through our fax machine. And it was from a man called Teizoi Marahashi. And he said, I am the man who bought the whole of your exhibition in Paris in 1995. And I have built a museum. <laughs> and... <laughs> And he said, I, I particularly specialise in um, surrealism. I've got a lot of Salvador Dali's, of Di Chirico, etc. Um, but I'd like to invite you to come to Japan to visit the museum because I'm going to put on an exhibition of your work. And I'd like you to come with your husband and give a lecture. And this was my introduction to the wonderful Morahashi family. Um, it was just beyond compare. So here in the exhibition, you can see these installation shots. So there is Deadline, the painting we saw in the Paris Gallery and on book covers. Um, and other works, the, the, the Sunday painting with my parents in bed um, and the window. It was just so thrilling. I'd never been to Japan before or experience such a beautiful culture that was so unlike my own. It was a start of a new beginning, really, because one thing leads to another, and about three or four le years later, I got an email, and it said, um, <clears throat> we've just bought one of your paintings at auction. It's a newspaper work which we very much like, and we'd like to buy another. And it was from a firm in Saudi Arabia. So Richard sent four images of very big paintings, and they bought them all. Then they contacted me to say, we see you've been in Japan. Would you like to go back there to study the people and the culture to do a series of five large commissions? So... This one, Geiko and Mako, was the first of those commissions that I made. But it was so wonderful to be back in Japan. 
And this, um, the second one, I've used, is in Kyoto, or based on Kyoto, but I've used a large yellow Toyota taxi. <laughs> and the reason I've used a large yellow Toyota taxi is that the company in Saudi Arabia was celebrating their 50th anniversary, but it had been founded by the father of the president 50 years previously by importing four or five Toyota cars into Saudi Arabia. And they found they were so wonderful. They didn't rust or um, perish like other cars did due to the salt in the sand. So um, it somehow seemed like serendipity that I was back in Japan, but for another person. Camels? Ah, and the, the really interesting thing is that the Saudi Arabian government was so pleased with these Toyota cars, it became a policy for Bedouin to come in from the desert with their camels and exchange them for a Toyota car. <laughs> so you can see how that company became so successful. And this um, <clears throat> is the wonderful fish market that was in Tokyo. And um, we had to get up very early to go and observe this. Uh, the, auction of, the auctions of the fish, particularly the tuners, in which um, someone inscribed probably the sort of weight and the quality of each fish in what looked like red paint. Um, but it was very, very exciting. And it led on to me being approached by a group of Japanese people who were desperately trying to save that fish market because it was going to be moved. And so they um, asked if they could use this painting on the cover of a book they were producing. And they also used it on the end papers. And they also asked me to write a chapter in the book on why the fish market should be saved. Unfortunately, I think it worked, it, didn't it? Well, did it? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't think it worked because I think it was moved much like the fish market here in London. <clears throat> the White Heron Festival, which we saw in Asakusa, um, was so beautiful. Japanese festivals are so moving, and the players in the processions are geisha and university students. I think the white heron is actually a symbol for good fortune. This um, second one, the third painting, is the Festival of the Ages. And I did um, draw on um, drawings that I'd, and photographs I'd taken in Kyoto for this. And you can see the barrels of sake in the background. Um, and it was so picturesque and colourful. Anyway, MJ, who was the man, Mohammed Jamil, who'd commissioned me to go to Japan, was so impressed with the schedule we'd worked out for our Japanese visit that he said, would you like to come to Saudi Arabia um, to study the people and the culture here for a series of 10 commissions? <laughs> um, they were all big. But I'm not going to show you them all, but I'm showing you this one because um, this is the souk, or the carpet seller, but he presented this to the chairman of Toyota. So these things seem to be very cyclical and go round and round. A bit later, the Marahashi Museum, particularly Ijai, who is the director, commissioned me to do four more paintings, and this time of... British wild animals. So the fox, the badger, the hare, and an owl. And they actually were exhibited in my last exhibition there. And here you can see an installation shot of them in situ. Another work that they also bought more recently is an autobiographical piece. It's three-dimensional. So the shoes around the frame are all shoes that I've worn at different times in my life. And the shoes in the centre of the frame, some are painted in just two-dimensional. 
but other uh, actual parts of shoes or whole shoes. And on each of them, I have written where I was and when I wore these shoes. So they do form a journal of my life. And I used the crow because I felt that he echoed the sculptural qualities of the high heel shoes. AI wouldn't have thought of that. So yes, Richard's just reminding me he doesn't think AI would have thought of that. So, <laughs> um, When I'm working in my studio, I often listen to the BBC Radio 4, the news programmes, and in 2011... I was heartbroken and distressed when I heard of the tsunami in Japan and particularly in the Fukushima area. Um, and so when I have a crisis or a problem or there's something I'm very worried about in life, I tend to paint it. Um, so here I have a geisha looking through the shutters at a seascape that for me, sort of represents the terrible turmoil of a tsunami. Um, it's quite a big work, so it's about six foot wide, but it's also quite high. And you can see here that it actually, the kimono flows out of the painting, rather like water might flow, out of the painting onto the floor. And here I'm actually painting the kimono, which probably echoes the fact that for a while at college I'd studied textile design and so all these things come in useful at one time or another. This painting was exhibited again in the Morahashi Museum of Modern Art <clears throat> but it actually belongs to a man called Sir David McMurtry who founded an engineering company, a very, very clever man um, called Renishaw and Renishaw, I think, have factories in Japan as well. Another work that I painted at that time, thinking of the history of tsunamis that Japan has suffered. And here, I've perhaps drawn inspiration from the wonderful Japanese art of anime. And so a lot of the fleeing characters to me, feel like they might have been in an anime story. So they're all fleeing from the water. This was also in an exhibition at the Morahashi Museum, but lives in the collection of um, two friends in Gloucestershire, the Cotswolds. It's, it's quite small. It's only about so big, and it's in a sort of box-like frame. <clears throat> Other mother's sons... Well, we entered into the Gulf War in the early 90s and my son was sort of in his teens then and Henrietta, my daughter's boyfriend, was probably 17 or so and I thought, how frightening it must be for mothers when their sons are conscripted into fighting forces to fight these battles that they risk their lives in. You spend your life nurturing this infant into manhood and that suddenly he can be taken away to fight. Um, so I made this painting called Other Mother's Sons and it's also on a corrugated or undulating base made out of timber and then covered in canvas <clears throat> and I tried to make the soldiers look as if they were from different nationalities and perhaps different regiments and this painting now lives in the permanent collection of the Imperial War Museum in London so this is one of those paintings that one of my dealers at the time called Robert um, was going to show my work at Art London, the big art fair that's held here each January. He said, PJ, I want you to paint something that will stop people in their step. And he had a catalogue or book of my work, and he said, something like that. And he pointed to a painting I'd made 
called The Writing of the Wall, which was of a man in a gas mask, um, which had been shown at the Royal Academy a few years earlier. And he said, could you, you know, something that will stop them in their steps. So this was what I came up with. I thought, this is terrible. We're entering into a new millennium and we're still as barbaric as ever, fighting wars. So I decided I would use as a symbol for the new millennium a baby, a newborn child, and I would give him a nurse or a mother, um, and she was inspired by um, religious icons of the Madonna. But I would also make it rather more frightening by putting a gas mask close to the baby. And you can see um, the child is on a drip. Um, and outside, there is terrible um, war going on. You can see lots of flames. And um, I've used a black crow in the top triangle to, as a symbol of something ominous. And um, debauchery in the bottom three panels. Anyway. Richard arrived at the art fair with this huge painting. It's eight foot high by six foot wide. And Robert looked at it and he said, PJ, I just find that so disturbing. And he'd recently had a new baby. And um, I said to Richard, oh, I don't think I can let him exhibit it because he obviously finds it too disturbing. So on this occasion, I gave him... Um, a large corrugated newspaper work instead. But this went on to tour the country um, in an exhibition that was about children in war-torn countries called A Picture of Innocence. It was also exhibited at Gloucester City Museum in an exhibition called Conflict. And it went on to form <coughs> the cover of a King Crimson album. And the interesting thing is, when Robert Fripp was looking at it on his laptop, um, Toya, who is his wife, came in and said, Robert, we must have that painting. And so it actually lives in their collection in Pershaw. Now, this is my finishing piece, and it's really... I painted it during the pandemic. It was such a dire time for the whole of the globe. All of us everywhere were suffering. And as a humanity, we were trying to find an answer collectively. And thank goodness, very, very clever people developed vaccines, which saved most of us, but not all. So I tried to think of a symbol of sort of strength. And I thought, oh, sumo wrestlers. But I also see it a bit like a symbol for what is happening here at SOAS, the coming together of two great forces, SOAS and the Morahashi Museum of Modern Art, to form this incredible new course on art and creativity. <laughs> So, Fabio, I have another confession to make. Oh, God. <laughs> yes, I, what is it this time? <laughs> I have eaten chips wrapped in newspapers. <laughs> have you? I think I'm too young for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> anyway, so um, last but not least, our final speaker is one of our own. Uh, Dr. Monica Hinkio is a lecturer in the arts of Japan here at SOAS. She's also a curator, and this summer, the Dalich Picture Gallery in London will show the first UK exhibition uh, on the Yoshida family of Japanese uh, printmakers curated by Monica. Uh, she'll talk about her creativity and her experience in the work of curation. Please give a round of applause for Monica Hinkio. <laughs> Uh, 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Fabio and also Satuna san for having me in this very illustrious group of speakers. And PJ, you said early on it was a hard act to follow the music. It is even harder for me to follow your wonderful talk, and I can most certainly say that uh, AI won't be able to show that compassion and insight that you showed us tonight, um, giving us this wonderful overview of your, your work. So thank you very much indeed. <laughs> What I would like to talk about, and uh, Satuna san briefly mentioned it, that I'm also curating uh, exhibitions next to being uh, an academic here. And when I was invited to give the talk, I thought, oh, what shall I talk about? And so I started with the more traditional sense what a curator uh, would do. Of course, it comes from the Latin word curare, which means to take care of, or to nurse, or to look after. And these very traditional roles are connected with terms like custodial, uh, which of course means that we preserve and oversee collections. But also navigatory, or navigation, is also an important part, a role that is focused on archiving and cataloging pieces of art so that audiences can readily access them. The third point is discerning. It is the responsibility of a curator to decide which artists and themes to include uh, and feature and to describe it with uh, Nick Waterloo uh, using the eye of discernment for art that is placed under the guardianship of curators. But of course, we have a variety of fields where we can curate art. Uh, usually we think of museums, but um, of course galleries, commercial galleries, it's a completely different type of curating uh, that we encounter there. Uh, we have potential buyers um, that come and po uh, potential collectors, of course, that engage with these galleries. We have the internet. Uh, looking at AI curated and constructed artwork. I mean, the internet is full of it. And of course, we also have internet curators who curate the internet. But also producing lectures, uh, all of us, um, is kind of creating the, the content that we bring closer uh, to our students. I think that is also a kind of curatorship uh, of the knowledge uh, of our expert fields. And of course, it's an evolving field, curation, and constantly changing. We have new discourses uh, relating to curating, and I've just put here a variety of terms uh, together uh, and uh, topics that uh, relate to uh, all sorts of aspects creating as knowledge production, rethinking, but also, for example, spectatorship. Uh, it evolves or uh, who we would like to address, for example. And also engaging with the viewers and uh, the co-curators or the public being co-curators. Uh, that is uh, a very uh, popular uh, theme to actually engage visitors uh, with the exhibition very closely. We have, of course, new technologies uh, that we can embed uh, into these shows. And about the themes that have particular also here been quite strong and important at uh, SOAS recently are topics like decolonization, restitution, or the inclusion of the global south. Uh, these are all aspects that we need to include when we want to uh, curate and be up to date with the fields and the evolving uh, aspects of curation. But today I also then went into uh, chat GPT and I did ask um, Japanese art and generative AI and how do they intersect and these were the kind of notions that were given when I uh, put this into 
uh, ChatGPT. And so it came up with style transfer. And it said, generative models can be trained to learn the styles of Japanese art and master and apply them to new images. This can evolve transferring the brushstroke patterns, color palettes, and composition techniques characteristic of Japanese art onto digital or traditional artworks. Another aspect that was mentioned is artistic creation. Artists and researchers have used generative AI to create original artworks inspired by Japanese themes, motifs, and aesthetics. For instance, a deep learning model can be trained on a data set of Japanese paintings or prints to generate new pieces that reflect the style and spirit of traditional Japanese art. Or character design, anime and manga characters are central to Japanese visual culture. Generative models can be employed to generate new character designs, either by synthesizing features from existing characters or by creating entirely novel designs inspired by the conventions of anime and manga. Or even landscape generation. It said landscapes, uh, the Japanese landscapes, including serene gardens, majestic mountains, or tranquil waterfalls have long been recurring motifs uh, in Japanese art. And generative models can be used to generate new landscapes that capture the essence of Japanese scenery, incorporating elements such as cherry blossom, pagodas, or toy gates. Another aspect is interactive art. Some artists and technologists have explored interactive installations that use generative AI to engage audiences with Japanese art themes. For example, visitors might be able to manipulate digital bar strokes or contribute to the creation of collaborative artworks using uh, generative algorithms. And last, it's cultural preservation. AI can also be employed in cultural preservation efforts related to Japanese art. For instance, researchers have developed algorithms for restoring damaged or deteriorated artworks based on historical records and stylistic analysis. So with these kind of possibilities, um, rather exciting possibilities, how AI can intersect and interact with Japanese art here in particular, I think there is certainly um, new approaches that we can see, but it's, it's essential to approach these technologies with sensitivity to the cultural context and ethical considerations. Additionally, collaboration between artists and technologists and cultural experts can enrich the development and application of generative AI in the realm of Japanese art, as we can see here. I went a step further and I asked curating Japanese art with ChatGPT. And it came up with this list of topics that we can address when we are curating Japanese art. It is not exclusive uh, for curating an exhibition on Japanese art. Of course, we usually have some sort of historical context. We are selecting certain themes and motifs that we would like to focus on. We might dip into traditional art, but also contemporary art, depending uh, what uh, we choose generally as a topic. Regional variations, and this has become uh, really uh, an important matter, um, definitely, when we are looking at Japanese art in particular, uh, looking at the arts of Okinawa, or uh, I hope uh, many of you have already been to Japan House, where there's this fantastic exhibition on Aino art and culture. Uh, if you have not been there, please go. It is these kind of uh, artifacts and cultures that we do need uh, to address as well. And of course, Japan is closely related to high craftsmanship, high quality of craftsmanship 
and fascinating techniques that they applied. Also, interdisciplinary connections. Uh, one of my field is uh, Japanism. So there is certainly, yeah, the movements of Impressionism and Art Nouveau that were heavily influenced by Japan. But then, of course, with every exhibition, we have also the engagement and education and all the programs that are being uh, put together by the variety of departments in museums. The next deck I did, because my field is uh, Japanese woodblock prints, ukiyo-e. I did ask Chat GPT, uh, curating an exhibition on ukiyo-e. And <laughs> this is what it came up with, and it even gave me a title. It said, Ephemera Beauty, A Journey Through ukiyo and it produced this wonderful exhibition layout. We have an introduction to ukiyo -e. Of course, the floating world is addressed. Uh, it dwells into nature's beauty, portraits of elegance, of course, then touching on uh, the portraits of, well, partly the kabuki actors that are so dominant, but also the beauties, the uh, courtesans. Uh, but another important f field within ukiyo-e are myth and legends, it, everyday life, particularly of the townspeople that is being depicted in ukiyo-e, uh, is also one of the uh, themes here. Uh, influence and legacy, of course, yeah, relating closely also to genre painting uh, that existed before ukiyo-e came about during the Edo period in the 17th century. But then also, the interactiveness that has become so important uh, in, in particular in recent years also, as I already said, including uh, new technologies. Uh, here, creating your own ukiyo-e. And of course, we have a lot of fabulous ukiyo-e artists who uh, live here uh, in London. So yeah, we can always uh, engage uh, them with exhibitions uh, that we produce on ukiyo-e or we have a film screening on Ukiyo-e. So uh, when I yeah, will be showing the exhibition at the Dulwich Picture Gallery in, from June onwards, uh, we will have a video there that shows us how uh, Ukiyo-e in particular, well, it's not Ukiyo-e, but of course the Shin Hanga, the prints that the Yoshida family produced, uh, how Yoshida Hiroshi, uh, the first uh, of the family, uh, of printmakers, the first generation, and uh, one of his master carvers uh, produced these wonderful prints. And of course, yeah, every show, every exhibition, every uh, museum uh, need a gift shop where you can buy all sorts of stuff. So all this was very nicely incorporated in this layout here uh, by ChatGPT. Found that really fascinating to uh, experiment with that. But then, I went further and asked Night Cafe, the app, uh, to generate a work based on the London skyline, one in Yoshida Hiroshi style, uh, and on the right-hand side, you see a London skyline in Ukiyo-e style. And of course, G Chat GPT is a text-based app. But it was really fascinating when I put exactly these words uh, into the search engine uh, there. And it told me, as, uh, AI, as an AI uh, text-based uh, model, I'm unable to create visual images directly. However, I can provide you with a description of what a ukiyo image of London might look like. And you can imagine it based on that description. In the style of ukiyo-e, which is a genre of Japanese art that flourished from the 17th through the 19th centuries, particularly during the Edo period, uh, ukiyo-e image of London might depict iconic landmarks and scenes of daily life in the city. And here is a description of what such an image could include. Title, London City of Contrasts. The image features the River Thames winding its way through the bustling cityscape with wooden bridges spanning in its breadth. In the foreground, we see a bustling street scene with merchants. 
selling their wares from uh, small stalls. Pedestrians in traditional Western attire mingled with those wearing more exotic garments, hinting at the multicultural nature of London. Towering above the scene is the unmistakable silhouette of Big Ben, its intricate details rendered in the distinctive ukiyo-e style. Nearby, the Houses of Parliament and proudly their Gothic architecture contrasting with the surrounding buildings. To the right, we glimpse the majestic dome of St. Paul's Cathedral, rising above the rooftops, its uh, presence dominating the skyline. In the distance, the Tower of London looms surrounded by a moat and battlements, a symbol of the city's rich history. On the river, boats of all shapes and sizes navigate the busy waterway from elegant sailboats to bustling steamships. Fishermen cast their nets from wooden rowboats while ferries shuttle passengers across the river. In the background, the city spreads out in a patchwork of rooftops, chimneys and spires disappearing into the misty horizon. Despite the hustle and bustle of urban life, there is a sense of tranquility and harmony in the scene, capturing the timeless beauty of London in the style of Okeyoe. And I found it really so fascinating that even though I only produce these two prompts uh, in a night cafe, and then Chat GPT really producing more or less in text version what then uh, the, the image app actually produced. Uh, looking at these, they are most definitely fascinating, but I don't think we have to fear uh, that they will overtake, I hope, Okioi uh, in, in popularity. Uh, they are most definitely fascinating to look at, and there are certain, uh, yeah, certainly characteristics of ukiyo-e that are embedded in these two generated artworks. But uh, yeah, it was fascinating for me to to experiment uh, uh, with these uh, apps. So when we had heading into AI and curating art, so as we have just seen with these examples. Um, AI can be a tool and a complement uh, to human effort uh, in creating art rather than solely a threat. I mean, for me as an academic, uh, it is certainly a threat when I see students, of course, using ChatGPT for their essays uh, and reports. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that, that's another <laughs> thing I won't be going into tonight. But there I, I certainly see a threat. But here are a few per, uh, perspectives on how AI interacts with art creation. Assistance, it can analyze and, and it can support a curator uh, by analyzing large amounts of data, suggesting connections between artworks, providing insights into audience preferences, and even identifying trends in art history. This can save time and effort for curators, allowing them to focus more on the creative and conceptual aspects of their work. Accessibility. AI can enhance the accessibility of art by helping to organize and categorize collections, creating virtual exhibitions, and providing alternative ways for people to engage with artworks, such as through augmented reality, or virtual reality experiences that have become very popular. This can make art more inclusive and reach broader audiences. But of course, we have challenges. However, these challenges and limitations to AI in art curation, uh, we certainly have to look at. AI uh, algorithms may have biases or limitations in understanding the cultural, historical, and emotional context of artworks, which are crucial aspects of curation. As we have just seen, uh, where PJ uh, uh, spoke so brilliantly about her uh, works. Additionally, there are ethical considerations regarding the use of, uh, of AI in cultural heritage and the potential displacement of human curators. And of course, there can also be collaboration 
the most effective approach might be a collaboration between AI and human curators. By combining the uh, computational power of AI with human expertise, we can achieve more nuance and insightful curations, maybe, that considers both objective data and subjective interpretations of art. So we certainly have uh, challenges, but it is also definitely, uh, it can complement AI and the human. And also creativity. I mean, often curation is seen as a management of creativity. And I really like always this um, quote here by Jonathan Plucker on creativity, uh, what it means for curators. But too much creativity can also hamper the narrative of an exhibition, of a show. But generally, creativity in relationship to um, curating, to exhibitions, it is certainly a critical means to create an enhanced value, uh, which is yeah, meaningful and uh, lasting. So really to end, I'm, I'm, I'm torn. It certainly poses some challenges to traditional methods of art curation, but generally I think AI uh, also offers opportunities for innovation, accessibility and collaboration. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Monica, for a very thoughtful end to the first part of our e evening. Have you? <laughs> I have a confession to make. Mother. <laughs> I've tried some of the sake right now, and it's amazing. So I'm going to go and get some more. All right. OK, you go ahead. Well, it remains for me to say thank you very much for coming. Thank you, the big thank you, especially to our sponsors, Sevier Holdings and the Morashi Museum of Modern Art. Please join us outside for a platter of sushi and really exceptional uh, sake. I've kept that in my office for the last five days and was <laughs> very tempted at every turn. Uh, so please take this as an opportunity um, to join us and to ask questions of the speakers outside. Thank you very much for coming and to do it.